Met Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As Christians, as Episcopalians, part of this universal Catholic faith, on a weekly basis, when we come to church, we open our prayer books after the sermon and we say uh, the Nicene Creed to affirm the faith of the church, but also to reaffirm our own faith. Wherever we are, with whatever questions we have, we kind of have this moment together after the sermon where we can bring all of those, even the mystery of it all, and say, this is what the church believes, uh, and hold all of our questions up to that. And uh, so I have, uh, was really struck uh, by, in today's reading, this idea of weak believers. And so uh, you have the gift of my 22nd sermon on the Nicene Creed and on the last phrase. So uh, whether, whether, let's hope that you're strong believers when I'm done. Um, the last phrase of the Nicene Creed is that we believe in a world to come. We believe in a world to come. And this is uh, what's fascinating to me after doing all of these is that this is as important as any other phrase of the creed. Normally, it's that little bit right before we say amen. And uh, I have to be honest and say I don't pay a whole lot of attention to it. I'm ready to move on by that point, right? Uh, And yet, it has, it's a very deep, powerful, spiritual, theological idea to say that we believe in a world to come. When we say we believe in this world to come, we're saying two different things. And I just want to briefly touch on them. Tony is well-formed in his training, and uh, Jill is beginning her, so they can answer any questions uh, after, after I leave, right? you will be ready. Yeah, good. Um, uh, perhaps the most controversial piece of this is the fact that we believe that God is even now transforming this world through the faith of those who believe. This idea that God is active in the world around us. I think part of what makes that so difficult is the world around us, <laughs> right? Like it's just hard. And, and that could be family stuff. It doesn't have to be political stuff. I mean, it could be anything, but we are burdened by the life in which we live at this time, I think. And uh, it doesn't, uh, and to, to claim this, uh, uh, that God is transforming stuff now, uh, which is the first thing I want to talk about, is, is to make a radical statement about the world in which we live. Uh, but instead of understanding the gospel as something to say about how we live today, uh, what I want to say is it's more about uh, how we're to see one another from the vantage point of the cross and from the place where Jesus stands. Uh, and to see that at the world and the people in it as if uh, Jesus uh, saw it. In this way, we learn to glorify God through worship and through action in this world, certainly, uh, but it is a, a preparation for the next. Even when we install new clergy, uh, we tell them to teach the people to glorify this God in this world and, so that they are ready to glorify God in the next. That's part of what we're, part of what we're doing. But the way I like to think about it is this. If we can't learn to give ourselves to people who are radically different than us in this world, how are we able to give ourselves over to a God who's completely different than us? Right? That that that's part of the practice, the discipline, the spiritual work that we have to do. And not only do we pray this here, but it is a key piece to the Lord's prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This idea that uh, not, and my guess is most days, you know, you just want to say, Jesus, come on now. You know, I just want it to, like, right now, would you please just come? And, uh, but we pray, this is part of our discipline. Living like Jesus makes the kingdom present 
and part of embracing each other and uh, the brokenness of the world as a way of seeing that Jesus and his kingdom has come near, as it says in Luke's gospel. When our day is done and our, uh, we offer prayers of thanksgiving, uh, sometimes just to say, thank you, Lord, the day is over. Uh, I wonder, are we able to say grace over those places where we saw the kingdom today? And what would it mean for us to open up and live each day to prepare ourselves in the morning to look for the kingdom and how we can be a part of it versus and how that would end our day then to be able to say, oh, I saw it here or I saw it there. Uh, It was present in my life today. It's not this foreign something, but I saw it. We become witnesses, people who don't just have to say it by faith, but people who begin to experience and see what God's doing. We even have a Eucharistic prayer that says, help us to see God's hand at work in the world. Now, there are probably a lot of things that I uh, don't agree with uh, the theologian N.T. Wright on. Um, uh, and uh, he, I have a very long letter from him, so I know that he does not agree with me on some of those things. Uh, but on this one thing, one thing, we're actually very, very much alike, and that is this. He, he wrote, humans are not just decoration amidst the creation. They're not just a sort of primary characters in God's puppet show. It's much more than that. God has created us to be responsible agents within the world. We're not building God's kingdom, we're building for the kingdom. And I actually think that's a beautiful way to think about it, that we're participating in something that God is even now bringing about. And the scripture is filled with this testimony, the fact that the kingdom of heaven is not something we wait for, but something that we're a part of now. Uh, the, by virtue of the gospel being preached and the work of the Holy Spirit, by the work of Jesus upon the cross, uh, the fact that we have a sense of deep forgiveness uh, and have the possibility at every moment to say we're sorry, uh, repent, and also to seek reconciliation. Those are profound tools in our toolbox for facing the world around us. But I think we're too tempted to think that the last bit of the creed is about some future place and time. It is, but it's mostly about the work of God in this world. And I like what Cynthia Bergeau says on on this topic. You are the way that God feeds the hungry, clothes the naked, frees the wrongly imprisoned. You are the way God brings justice, mercy, and humility of life to this world. I believe this is our work. This is the work of the church. We're called to lift up the stones of the kingdom of God as they sing, Thy kingdom comes, thy kingdom comes. And maybe that should be our prayer first thing in the morning to remind us that it's coming and it may even be present with us in this moment. Now, as we use a lot of words to express the future experience, we have uh, a lot more problems, right? Because so far, nobody here in this room has experienced that kingdom yet to come, right? The second part of what we say when we say we expect the kingdom. And uh, so... uh, I like to stick with Paul in the Bible on this instead of making stuff up. (laughs) Uh, Just to say that uh, I think Paul and John, all of them have some really beautiful pieces uh, to offer us a sense. Uh, But primarily, it's this idea from 1 Thessalonians uh, that Paul writes. This is so powerful. This idea that the the dying, the dead, and the living will be brought into heaven led by the great shepherd, right? Uh, And that that is just a beautiful image. Uh, David Bentley Hart describes it as this massive rise. Have you ever seen the art of Gustave Doré, for instance, this massive rising up of souls into heaven with Christ leading them? Uh, to meet their God. And I love that. Oh, I get chills. I mean, I just kind of love that image. I have no clue what that's going to be like. But if it's anything like that, uh, that sounds amazing. And also would say that I agree with, um, with N.T. Wright uh, and uh, Rob Bell and others on this. It will be a consummation of all things and all people. Uh, and uh, uh, if C.S. Lewis has anything to say about it, it's, 
that, you know, maybe C.S. Lewis had some wisdom, right? Uh, that uh, C.S. Lewis had that great idea that it's not God who seeks to embrace us, but rather us who will repel if we don't work to make ourselves available to that different God than us. Uh, and the great divorce. Paul proclaims those words, neither death nor life nor angels nor archangels nor things present nor things imminent nor powers nor height nor depth can separate us from the love of God. And the prayer book, if you've ever been to a funeral, has those beautiful words. All of us, as we go down to the grave, proclaim this truth of the world to come. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. So I want to close by saying that our world has ingrained in us that wisdom is something learned in the mind, known and repeated. Facts can be repeated. But I don't believe faith is something that we memorize and learn. I think faith is the process of bringing our questions, our imaginations, our holy selves, our whole selves to the great and deep questions of this world. And sometimes we have to proclaim the things that we're not sure about even now so that we may open our eyes to see what God is doing. I argue that wisdom is a whole body experience and that faith isn't something we only know, but we have to experience it. To be the body of Christ is both to be an individual and corporate physical reality in this world that says this isn't the way that this is supposed to be. It's different. And I'm going to live that difference in my body and in my relationships with others. I'll just close with a quote from Augustine of Hippo. What sort of countenance does love have? With this expectation, what sort of shape does it have? What sort of height does it have? What sort of feet does it have? What sort of hands does it have? No one can say, wrote Augustine, yet it has feet for they lead to the church. It has hands for they stretch out to the poor person. It has eyes for that is how he is in need, is understood, is indeed understood. Blessed is he who understands and lives. Our faith in Christ is something that we must live. It is an essence of the kingdom of God in this world and in the next, the kingdom of God and life that we're baptized into. So I hope that as we are all most likely weak believers for whom Christ died, as Paul says, may we live our faith with all of those questions so that in the end, maybe we'll be prepared to meet the God who is completely different than ourselves. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop, and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.